welcome to the MVP Show. This week we're speaking with none other than Andrew Lee, all the way from South Australia. Gotta say I like Andrew, I've worked with him, and uh, yeah, he's doing some great things in the whole PCF Power Apps component framework at the moment. So why don't you sit back, listen as we discuss his life and journey as an MVP, and also have a bit of a robust discussion around the Power Apps component framework. Full show notes can be found at nz365guy.com forward slash 117. Now let's get on with the show. Hello, Andrew, and welcome to the MVP show. Thanks very much for having me, Mark. Mate, good to catch up with you again. You know, uh, we've worked together. We've, uh, shall we say, played together. And, of course, you're uh, an MVP as well. How are things going? Yeah, really good. Thanks, mate. Yeah, really good. Um, yeah, like you said, we have worked together. And it's uh, it's good catching up with you again. And, uh, yeah, so, no, things have been really well. Uh, pretty busy down under. Yep. So, so you're in Adelaide, Australia. And uh, tell us a bit about why you love living in Adelaide and uh, about the loves of your life. Oh, okay. Um, so Adelaide, like you said, is in South Australia. It's a, it's a predominantly known as a wine region as well as a manufacturing region. Uh, it's actually pretty chill uh, down here. There's a population of about one and a half million people. Um, I love the lifestyle here. It's just, uh, it's, it's like a, uh, you know, not, not a huge, busy, bustling city, but it's just big enough, I think. And uh, yeah, so you know, uh, love the restaurant culture, coffee culture. It's uh, yeah, it's great. Carry on the loves of your life. Yeah, I got uh, as you know, I got two little girls, uh, eight and uh, three, and uh, they are certainly a handful, but uh, they're very, uh, very, very fun. We just got back from a trip down to Singapore and Malaysia just to see the in-laws and that. So yeah, really, really having a great time with them. Okay, so I, when I say the love of your life, I expect your wife to kind of feature in some way. <laughs> She'll kill me, won't she? Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, so Shirley, of course. Yeah, so we just celebrated our 12th anniversary, actually. Wow, so, wow. Yeah, yeah. Mate, I didn't realise you had two years on me there. That's oh, really? Good. Right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Great. Very good, very good. So kind of what, what do you get up to for a day job? Uh, yes, yeah, so I'm, I'm currently uh, employed as a associate director at uh, KPMG within their Microsoft go-to-market team, um, and that's predominantly a, a technical pre-sales role. So essentially means I've, I've got a foot in technology and I work very closely with vendors, clients, uh, business development uh, people, um, but I predominantly come from a, um, a consulting background and sort of spent the last 18 years in IT and yeah, it's sort of taken me all sorts of places now. So tell us a bit about that journey. Like, how, how, well, first of all, how did you end up becoming an MVP? How long have you been an MVP and, and what's the experience? Ah, right. Okay. So, you know, look, I, I was awarded the MVP, I think it was in January or February last year. Um, uh, that was an interesting exercise. Uh, I wasn't really expecting that. But, I, I mean, I've, I'd, I'd, I've been working, obviously, really closely with you, Mark. And and I think we we spent a couple of years or two or three years uh, working together very closely. Uh, I think I, re- I reported into you at that time, and the sort of I was thinking I was at that stage of my life, and I was thinking, well, what what do I really want to do with uh, my career, and where do I want to go with things? And look, I was really active in the community already, and uh, I think that's when I talked to you about you know what, what's the MVP program like, and I think you ended up in nominating me. Um, and so, yeah, you know, that sort of got the ball rolling, and you know, like uh, sort of one thing led to another, and started doing more and more uh, stuff um, with the community, and yeah, that's that's how I got to become a, an MVP. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, kind of tell us what are the the big things that you do in the community in Australia? You, I know you're active in the uh, the overall user group scene for the country, and uh, tell us a bit about that and what else. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I'm so I've got an active role in terms of the uh, Dynamics 365 user group in Australia. Uh, co-chair that uh, with yourself, Mark, and uh, uh, we we run user groups in uh, I think pretty much every mainland state uh, of Australia, along with our chapter leads uh, who are doing a fantastic job around that. 
Um, also have a number of things that I've, a couple of initiatives that I've got right now, and that's around um, GitHub and having open source projects. Um, and I've got about seven or eight different projects, mainly around the, the new Power Apps component framework and, and just around user experience, because I think that's a pretty important area that uh, we should all be playing in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is interesting. So you, you've really, you know, I was at uh, BizApp Summit recently and your name or your technology was on stage. Uh, I don't know if you're aware of that, but uh, there was uh, there's definitely some screenshots of what you have done around PCF. Tell us what what are your thoughts, what are your initial thoughts based on what you've done thus far uh, on the Power Apps component framework? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. Um, so I, I think in terms of what Power Apps component framework gives us, uh, it gives us a lot more control over the overall look and feel and the whole user experience. And I think that's something that's been, I think that's pre- something that's been lacking uh, in, in, in a lot of ways with Dynamics and the whole Power App suite. Uh, I think this gives us a really easy and intuitive way with a very low barrier to entry to making a really good user experience. And so I've got a, I've got a C-sharp sort of background, so I could sort of pick things up pretty quickly, but I was completely new to the Power Apps component framework, and I thought this might be a really good exercise for me to learn more about TypeScript, uh, a little bit about React, that sort of stuff, and then share my learnings, and then also produce some open source projects that to get other people really excited about, you know, um, uh, user experience with uh, with the Power Platform, yeah. So, so do do you see ultimately that the canvas that you have to work on? Let's let's look model driven side of the house to start with. Do you see that potentially, apart from the left hand navigation and the top nav bar, that the entire rest of the screen becomes real estate that you can uh, design, create on with PCF? Um, yeah. Yeah, I think the world's your oyster. Um, you know, it gives you a, a, a lot more uh, functionality. It gives you a lot more ways you can manipulate things in a very, uh, I think, very consistent, supported fashion. Uh, I think if you've got sort of some web development uh, background, I think this, that 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 skill set translates directly to being able to manipulate that canvas. So I think it's perfect. I mean, web devs do this on a sort of daily basis. They create custom apps and everything that look fantastic. And I think that now we're finally starting to get that the advantages of th- those sorts of things uh, into Power Apps, which is great. Yeah. Okay. So tell us about uh, you know the the should I say that you know PCF is replacing um, web resources? Would that be a, a fair justification? I I have said that on a number of occasions uh, when I've been sort of speaking publicly about that. I mean, it's not it's not a hundred percent true. Uh, I think uh, there are probably still use cases for web resources, uh, but I think pretty much. Do you, nearly, have, do you have any off the top of your head? I don't have any on the top of my head. Like, okay, I, that's I, cool, Karen. That's cool. Yeah, I, I spoke to uh, uh, Himant, um, the product manager for, and, and he, he, he he's suggesting that there probably are still a few scenarios out there um, where you'd still want to have uh, web resources. But like everything that I use uh, web resources for, I could easily convert into a, a, a custom control for sure. So I think you're going to see less and less of that. Um, yeah, I think, yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. So, so React JS has been a lot of calls for this to to be part of, you know, PCF. Um, there's been some recent announcements. Can you kind of walk us through those, and what do you think the implication is going to be? Uh, yeah. So, yeah, you're absolutely right. So, React is now officially supported by the uh, the Power Apps component framework. Uh, means we've got a we've got a path forward uh, for building out React controls. Uh, working out, uh, working with a couple of um, uh, individuals uh, in the community uh, around getting some blogs up on how to uh, easily build uh, React controls, um, and I think that and there was also the announcement that I think uh, Office Fabric is now coming as well, so that will give us a very consistent UI, very Office-like look and feel, 
Um, so we don't have to start from scratch around that. So I think that's fantastic. More, more and more libraries are coming on board. We can obviously add our own libraries, but it's just good to see Microsoft supporting this straight out the box. Okay, so so tell us what do you what do you see the future of PCFs going to be? Uh, I think there's I think re reusability is going to be a big thing. Uh, not not having to start things from scratch. I think there'll be a lot more opportunities for. Uh, people to, to build controls and commercialize them, like as in um, sell them on an app store and that sort of stuff. Um, and I think there'll be a, a lot easier ways you can just package and deploy just individual controls uh, rather than just complete solution files. So so do you, do you think we'll get to the point where we can create, if you like, Telerik type controls that you could sell as a component and other software uh, devs and or you know customers could could use those components within their applications. A hundred percent, yeah, hundred percent. I think we're definitely in this sort of Telerik sort of situation. We have these a library of very neat controls which have a you know a small licensing fee to use. Obviously, people have invested quite a lot of time to make these things look really beautiful. Um, they add tremendous amount of value to to customers and deployments. Uh, I definitely see uh, a really good market for that sort of stuff. Uh, if not, just built into uh, other accelerators. So if you've got an accelerator out there with a custom control, you package it as part of that and make that an offering. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, so where are you on your journey um, with PCF? Uh, well, I'm, I've just uh, well, I've just got back from holiday, so I'm just catching up with uh, the team and and also seeing what's going on with React. I'd like to get a couple of controls out there, um, open source. Uh, it's very simple React controls. I've I've got a couple of ideas in mind, um, and uh, yeah, and just sort of see where that takes takes us really, and and see if we can build some hype and momentum around PCF. Okay. Okay. So, if people want to kind of get involved with that, do you have a, like a Discord account that they can jump onto, and uh, you know you can collaborate? That's not a bad idea. Having a Discord server, I'm not sure there's getting that much at the moment. Primarily, uh, the PCF forums is probably the best place for conversations, and I think everyone's sort of been rallying around the the PCF uh, community group. Um, and uh, yeah, I think Hemant's got some really good stickies on there, sticky threads, uh, where where you can get all of the resources, basically everything you need to know to get started. Uh, for, uh, I think Guido's also got a, a, a gallery that he's, uh, and it's a fantastic gallery. He's doing a great job maintaining it too. Uh, so you want to see what other people are doing, def definitely head over to the gallery. Yeah, I, th I think it's critically important, you know, for for technologies like this to really kind of get a wider buy an audience sometimes you know i go up and i see kind of code bases that are 100 percent designed for developers to understand so even right now if you're on the react uh, js.org site you know you've got a simple component and it looks pretty similar to some HTML, uh, HTML JavaScript type code that I see and then says, you know, a stateful component, an application down to, but none of it gives me, well, it doesn't really give me the visuals. And often, you know, um, they're kind of, I feel the visuals are so important for kind of unlocking people's imagination about what's possible when they can't read code and kind of visualize how that's going to look. And, um, you know, the nuances of visuals is that it's visual, you know, it's why we have books with written words in it is quite different than a photo being taken. And, you know, a photo can sometimes represent, you know, uh, a thousand two thousand words you know they say a picture paints a thousand words and and sometimes like when i look at portraiture photography i'm like blown away how sometimes a photo can capture so much emotion meaning passion power all these different elements and it's yet a still photo and i just think that i hope that in any of these libraries that have been built out there's a lot of if you like visuals showing um more than you know a hello world example but that a real i want to see the sexy sizzly part of the of pcf you know the stuff where people look at um uh, a ui and go you know um I'll, I'll use a polite word you know like 
far out. That's incredible, right? Like, you know, I, man, I want this, like this, this, uh, this is making the technology like super sexy. And I hope that we're going to get not just, if you like, the, the hardcore devs, you know, getting into this, but that there's going to be a mashup between them and, you know, real rich UI designers and, and UX designers, you know, in that pool. And let's see some real, you know, wow type um, applications. Cause I just think that, you know, some of the most successful applications that, you know, I work with on the iPhone and stuff is that simple to use, but they're so intuitive in their design and they just they're pleasurable to look at right they're not they're not hard on the eye and sometimes we see so much software design that's literally hard on the eye right oh i absolutely agree with that and i think you're right seeing it visually seeing is believing and once you see something really sexy and it's not just you know a a really sexy control you want to see you want to make things easier for your customers right like for instance, if we want to dive into a record, that might be several clicks away. If we can build a control that has all the right information there, it shows up dynamically and just looks beautiful. You've reduced the number of clicks. It looks pleasant to the eye. Uh, I think it's just a win-win all the way around, you know? So Yeah, yeah, yeah. How How is usability? You mentioned usability. How has that been tied in to this, um, you know, component framework? Yeah, I think... Uh, I. Th- I mean, that that, uh, published a number of the -the out-of-the-box controls um, that come out of the model-driven app. Now, you can obviously take that and extend it to make it a lot more usable. And I think that's where, just to pick up on your point, where we can get some uh, CX guys, some customer experience guys, user experience guys to to, to, to cast their eye over it and say, well, how can we make this experience a bit better? Well, now we can actually do that technically as well. Uh, whereas before we would actually have to manipulate that control in probably some unsupported fashion. Uh, now there's definitely a way to do it. Yeah. Yeah. I like it. I like it. I'm just looking on the Telerik site and, you know, I go into some of uh, their reporting area and then they've got barcode reports and, you know, they've got every single barcode type, you know, UPCA, uh, Postnet, EAN8, all. But the thing is what I love is that, you know, right back to QR codes, of course, as well. And, but it's giving that kind of visual representation. So organizations, companies can go, man, this applies to my industry or my, you know, we've, uh, I've seen this type of stuff before and what I can have it in my technology. Now I think it's going to really open some interesting doors um, for the way people work with this technology and also make requests of whether it's their partners or ISVs and creating really beautiful um, visual applications. Yeah. Look, I mean, speaking of beautiful and using it in industry, uh, I saw a control recently. Uh, it was actually built out by Ung Kang in uh, New Zealand. Um, he, he did a really good con- uh, control around connections and it just showed like sort of a spider chart. You know, you've got that person in the middle and these are all the connections to the people and their connections to other people, right? And it just represented that. It was just beautiful. I think it was all done in React as well. Um, yeah, look, I think Th- that kind of use case, I never would even even imagine that, and uh, that sort of stuff is coming coming to fruition now. Yeah, um, I, I don't know what the APIs are like on LinkedIn, but you know, a use case I'd love to see is a component done where you could credential with your LinkedIn credential and perhaps build out like a bubble map or something like that, or a spider chart, like you're saying, of kind of. Where are your connections? Like, could I look at them from a geography point of view? Where are they in the world? Could I look at them from a, are they like me? In other words, they're in the same technology or industry area. I just think, man, to visualize that and see kind of, you know, what are your, what are your tight ties? In other words, who's interacting with your content more than others? Who's, I think it'd be some brilliant visual representation of that data set, you know, that's kind of, it's my data set. It's like based on me and my connections. I think it'd be pretty powerful, like for salespeople even to know and understand. I think there's some real interesting use cases that the, the question is though, how open is LinkedIn's API and whether they let you kind of report or consume 
some type of d- data around that to kind of give you those insights? Probably oh, not. <laughs> I, I agree. Like it's social analytics, I think is going to be a huge space. Uh, I think it's got uh, applications beyond sales. Is probably like politics, for instance, and you know, can- campaigning that sort of stuff. I think there's definitely really good use cases around that and getting access to those APIs. I think that's really going to open things up. Yeah, it's interesting. And I don't know if these folks are out there perhaps listening on the call, but it'd be so, I'd love to connect with people that have really started drilling into some third party APIs. Like, let's just take Facebook, Twitter, and LinkedIn as the the first three and go, you know, I don't just want the standard, oh, this person tweeted this and it was that type of a sentiment and that, oh, that's beautiful. Let's put that aside. Let's actually look at you know, uh, influence metrics, um, you know, really based on not like numbers, but actual engagement. I reckon engagement metrics are something that is not really, nobody's really doing it yet, you know, that you can really get insights on the engagement, not on the number of connections or the number of likes, because at the end of the day, I just think likes and thumbs up and stuff are really I don't know, benign, they're the kind of the simplest, most not thought out part of engagement. I think though, when people comment, when people probably comment is the biggest, because even if I looked at the order of importance, when I kind of validate engagement in the community, I think a like and a share is like, okay, but it's kind of like it, it took a click, right? Maybe two, but a, a, a comment is a totally different thing. A comment makes me stop and think, Hmm, what has this person said? Is there something that's worth, you know, drilling into in a bit more detail here? It's not just an aggregate number of you've got 50 likes on that post or something like that. It makes me stop. It makes me read. It makes me want to engage. And I just think that, you know, engagement is the future, right? Connection. Um, so, yeah. Sorry, well, I go What about tangent. sort, sort <laughs> of, uh, no, I think that's actually a really relevant point. Uh, like in, in terms of like, um analytics and and applying sentiment analysis on commentary i think that's really powerful i I know microsoft has done a lot around that especially with the uh, um customer insights and the old microsoft social engagement yeah it's dead though now right it's uh it's been replaced but yeah i've got to stop saying that um (laughs) (laughs) i'm I'm getting a reputation for saying everything that's got the nail in the coffin um uh no the thing is is that my you know uh market insights which is the new product and i've been on the 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 back-end program of that for maybe six months now is you know although uh, Microsoft social engagement was kind of, let's say the team, the resources, etc. that thing is fully dead, right? As in like the whole idea of aggregate, sorry, not aggregating, individually, um, you know, following and, and harvesting tweets and posts and things like that. Good night, that's gone. I think they've sunset that. And I think what the new product is, is coming out is going to be much more, tangibly insightful but if you like doesn't go down to that degree it's definitely not a uh it's not a a hoot suite or a um what's the other big one that uh man i used to have it yeah um i think of it yeah. Now. yeah the kind of social media where you can kind of pick out individual posts much more than um what you get with twitter's um tweet deck but kind of allows you to segment your audience and stuff and engage with them um, yeah, so you but, can still so, directly yeah. engage with these guys as well via the same channel, like via social no, media. No, so you so so you won't be on the new tool that Microsoft's bringing out. No, that's that that that's gone. This is about aggregate data. Um, so so you know, very very interesting. I you know, I had uh, I had the guy on my show, and uh, what was really interesting is that you know this also includes data telemetry data coming from Microsoft's browser footprint around the world. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, so, so very interesting insights, right? Because, you know, you imagine the telemetry being pulled across a browser around how people are interacting with the content on screen. Um, you know, no, no PII information, of course, but it's going to give some incredible insights about, you know, what are people into now? Why are they? What is the influencing? What were the triggers that got them here? Where did they exit? But like, how? What does that mean around my product or my industry or or my data set? So 
yeah, very interesting. I mean, I've seen uh, really interesting tie-ins with marketing automation where they uh, produce heat maps of where you're actually clicking or what you're looking at uh, on that particular screen. I think that's just really fascinating how they do that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's more for like, you know, UI design and stuff or, you know, uh, or user experience design. This is more for, you know, if I was a big brand, let's say I was Nike and I wanted to understand how I was doing against Adidas, right, Which are, or Puma, um, it would give me an understanding of what people are engaging with, not just of mine, but my competitors and kind of what was triggering those outcomes. So I think, yeah, pretty powerful story. But mate, look, listen to this, we're, we're crunching through some time. Um, um, uh, is there any questions that you wanted to ask me? You kind of intimated that you might've had one or two. Yeah, look, I, I, I did want to have a chat to you. I think we covered off PCF. I think that was really interesting. Uh, I think uh, I was listening to the recent YouTube uh, live stream that you did with Steve Mordew, and I thought that was really interesting around your conversations around CDS and the power, power portals uh, that are coming out. Is there, what, what do you see as sort of uh, the future of customer engagement and self-service um, with, with, especially with the power platform, where, where do you see that heading? You know? Uh, okay. So if we talk about customer engagement, right, which we're talking about sale, are you talking about sales like dynamics, three, six, five CE customer engagement for sales? Let's take that for a starting point, right? I think somebody within the engineering team needs to sit down and say, why are we still got a sales module that was architected based on 20 year old thinking, right? Sales has moved on, yet it's built on 20-year-old technology. Like when first CRMs came out, it's really not changed. We've got leads, we've got opportunities, accounts, contacts, of course, we, any, any system's going to need those to identify industry, or, you know, organizations and, and people, you know, those that kind of have blood, breathe, oxygen type thing. But the, the thing is, is that sales has changed so dramatically. You know, things like the product catalog and, and quotes, orders, invoices, most, I, man, in, in my experience, you know, 16 years of doing this, not many people, not many projects have I been on where we've needed to touch any of that type of stuff. In fact, I can count on no fingers the amount of times I've used the product pad catalog on a project, right? As in, um, so I just think that needs a reinvention. Like the way people sell nowadays, like, you, you know, often it's not just a one-off sale. It's a, like a sale that is kind of in the SaaS world we live in. It is kind of you receive money over a protracted period of time. So is it a sale at a pointed time that is kind of uh, atomized over a period? Like how is that represented on an opportunity? How does an opportunity handle those type of scenarios where um, more than ever, you know, um, the days of a single salesperson are now just not it, you know, and, and I know we've got team ownership and, you know, you can put the actors that are involved in the sale, you know, as part of that. I just think the whole, the concept of opportunity needs to be a hundred percent overhauled. Um, and the concept of lead needs to be a hundred percent overhauled. Um, you know, as a lot of people say leads not needed, I think it is for a, but I don't know, I'd call it a lead. I call it a, like a cleanup zone. It's an area for data cleansing of a bunch of records before I move them into an active pursue state, um, type thing. But then the other thing, you take something like, um, uh, the contact record. We, we live in a world, right, of social where people have LinkedIn connections, Facebook, uh, sorry, LinkedIn profiles, Facebook profiles, Twitter handles, Pinterest, there's a whole raft of them. Show me out of the box where social is represented on a contact record. We still have fax numbers. Who the hell uses fax? Like, it's kind of like nobody is kind of like, oh, don't touch this because that was always there. And it's kind of like, come on, evolve. I feel evolve, like I've opened man, the can know? of worms here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I just think sometimes people are so kind of in their box, they see their four walls around them and they don't poke their head out and go, shit, what is going on in the world? Um, you know, we're floating down a river and being left behind in our little box rather than kind of jumping out and really creating what's next. Now, I don't know, perhaps they're, you know, it's a product that's, you know, like a cash cow, which is you don't do much, you just sell it and it brings in the funds. Perhaps it's in that state for them. But I think there's, you know, an opportunity to really 
do something different from a customer engagement perspective using all the smart tools that we have now. And it's not just, you know, the inside stuff are great little tack-ons around the, around the edges, but I think there needs to be so much more around the core and enabling scenarios in a modern world that we live in when it comes to uh, customer engagement, sales, um, and the like. And so, I mean, I, I, that's a really good point there. And I think that customers have so many different personas now and they engage with us on so many different channels. And the challenge we used to have, Mark, when we were deploying together, if you remember, was, well, they, they're customers and they have different sorts of relationship with us as an organisation or the customer's organisation. Uh, they might be a rate payer. They might be a, a, a also a contractor to that company. There's all these different connections. How do we represent that? And, and I think that's always been a bit of a challenge. Um, yeah, out of the yeah, box. Yeah, agreed. Anyway. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. I just think they need to get some. You know, I like Clay is on the on the, on the you know the 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 user interface side of things, and I think he brings a good element to it. I just think. They can't get enough, if you like, people with real modern design expertise that go, you know, how do we make this an app on par with a consumer app? It's that awesome, right? People just, you know, I, I, was, I was chatting with Neil Benson um, more earlier this week, um, and he came up with a brilliant thing. I don't want people to adopt my technology. I want them to become addicted to it, right? Now, you imagine a business application that was addictive, like like Shazam, that, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah, but that's a consumer app, right? But imagine it, you know, imagine a business app that was, a, in other words, it was so good. It was so amazing that people loved it. They couldn't get, like, I mean, I love the technology, but I'm talking about as day-to-day -day work. I love it from a implementation, how it can transform organizations unbelievably, especially anyone going from manual processes. But what I think is that, you know, if people could think, you know, have set the bar at addiction, rather than than adoption, I think we start to change the game to a whole new level. Magic. Yeah, exactly. Mate, we're over time. You're the longest running podcast <laughs> I have done on the MVP show. It was really said, interesting. Yeah. 30, 32 minutes. It, it makes it different when you know the other person really well, I feel. And and the other thing I just find with podcasting is that if you're basically, you know, just in a and a scenario, it's a hard, right? Because I've got to, if, if you don't bounce off me, it dies, you know, and, and then I've got to go, oh, shit, I need to come up with another question to keep the conversation going, right? But what I like is that it's, I like this much more riffing kind of engagement where you're holding the conversation just as much as I'm holding it. I like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, we're you're bouncing well, off mate. each other. I well. love it. That's great. <laughs> awesome. Andrew, I need to ask you, of course, an end question because I always do. Who... Who, who, who? <laughs> Neil Benson, after the call, said, I wish you'd asked me this one. So I'm going to ask you it. Who do you think of when you think of the word punchable? Punchable? <laughs> Frank Hill. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, Frankie, I hope you're listening to this. That's classic. For those that don't know, Frank is a consultant in Melbourne, Australia, brilliant photographer. He's a great guy. Uh, I, I would refer to him as a GC and don't ask me to say that in full on air because uh, I might have to change the rating on my channel. Anyhow, <laughs> Andrew, thanks thanks for coming on here. If people want to kind of check out with, you know, what you're doing around PCF, maybe get involved with that, how can they connect with you? Uh, sure, Mark. Yeah, it's uh, been a pleasure. And uh, if you want to get in touch with me, it's uh, my blog is 365life.com, L-Y-F. And that's how you can catch up with me and get all the latest on PCF and all the other things I'm doing at the moment. Hey, thanks for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. I just want to tell you about a new show that I have, which is actually over on YouTube. So if you go to youtube.com forward slash nz365guy, feel free to subscribe, hit the bell, and every time... We go to go live. In fact, one hour before we go live on a live stream, you'll get notified. Uh, so we'd love you to come in, uh, jump on the live stream, chat with us. It's always on Wednesdays, uh, about three three o'clock uh, in, in Central uh, US time, 4 p.m. in London. So kind of give you some bearing on that. 
But yeah, you it's it's a live stream with Steve Mordu and myself on the Power Up Live Show. And you can ask questions and we will answer them. So I look forward to seeing you real soon on that channel. Until next week, have a good one. Bye.